I'm Mel Stewart, and this is the Swim Swam Podcast. Joining us today, we have a very, very, very special guest, Tori Hart, senior reporter formerly with SwimSwam.com, but she left us to go on to greener pastures at FrontOfficeSports.com. And uh, she's actually written for everybody. We're talking about an all-star here. She's written for Yahoo Sports, Sports Illustrated, SB Nation, and Swim Swam. Now she's 100% with FrontOfficeSports.com. Also joining us today is Coleman Hodges. Coleman Hodges is the head of production for Swim Swam, the man on deck. And today we are going to be talking about the International Swimming League. The reason why we are, Tori has written perhaps the most comprehensive feature that I have written, that I've read to date on the International Swimming League. If you're listening on a download, guys, press pause, go over to frontofficesports.com and read her feature. Despite some miscues, ISL provides hope for professional swimmers. That's a nice title. I don't, I don't know if I would have gone with that title. I'd have gone with a little more rough and tumble title, Tori. But it's but because the because the feature itself is really just a great piece of reporting, and it is um, you know you you you're a little bit tough. You're not a little bit tough. You're very tough. You're very honest. Just a little. I think just the littlest bit personally. But it, it, I think I think it's a very sober piece of reporting. And um, so, guys, if you're listening out there, we're gonna we're gonna get into a topic right at the outset you might find interesting. If you ever wanted to make it as a contributor. If you ever want to make it as as someone who is a part of this the part of the storytelling machine of sports, it's a lot like swimming. It's a lot like other sports. Um, frankly, you've got to be among the fifty best in the world to even make money, and then you've got to be among the Olympic finalists to make a lifestyle out of it, to make a living at it. It's really really tough. Uh, Tori Hart and and Coleman Hodges understand this intimately, and. Uh, I, I, once again, if you've paused and you've read the future from Tori, then you understand the difference between what she does and what everybody else does. So if you're out there and you're interested in being a part of, of this business, it's good to study the best. And uh, you guys all think that Coleman's just a big sweetheart and a nice guy and, and the man on deck with smiles, but the work that he does behind the scenes is, is, it is Herculean. So, um, that's an interesting topic. Maybe one day we'll have to come back and just talk about that process. But today, let's bring it back to ISL. Uh, this, I, how, how did you prepare to write a piece like this? Yeah, so for a few weeks, various people associated with the ISL had been in touch with me kind of saying, you know, I can make this summer available to talk about the bubble, how things are going there. I can make this summer available to just talk about, you know, what the league means to them in their career. And you know, I think as we all know, there's a lot of pieces out there that are just sort of explainers about the ISL, you know, here's what's happening. Let's just get it out there that this is what's happening. But, you know, I wanted to take it a step beyond that. And like you would for any other major sport, NBA, MLB, et cetera, you have to assume that your audience knows a little, at least, you know, a basic amount about what's happening. And um, so I was kind of hoping to to take it to the next level and elevate uh, elevate the story a bit for, for an audience that knows a little about what the league is and, you know, treat it like the legitimate entity it's trying to be. Um, so that eventually led into kind of this idea of what does this league mean for professional swimming? What does it mean to the swimmers? And, and what are the potential downfalls? What hurdles does it have to overcome? And, you know, just in talking to, you know, Tom and Rowdy and um, Ryan Murphy, Katanka, everyone that I talked to for the story, it became clear that they, the swimmers do love this league. It's not, you know, a media spectacle that they're being put out there to talk about why they love it so much. They really do. And I really wanted to take that into account in my story, but also get, um, you know, look at kind of why there is some hesitance among, you know, the real diehard swim community, the swim swim community, namely, um, to really em- embrace this league. And that's just kind of how things got started. Um, you know, as I've, as I've told Mel, I, idolized. I love reading Karen Krause at the New York Times. She is, you know, the swimming writer of, you know, record right now, I would say. And the weekend I was putting out this story, I saw that she had written an ISL story and I was like, oh no, did she get to this before I did? 
I don't even know what to think. I, you know, I'm clicking on it. I'm going, oh God, did she get my same sources? You know, whatever. Um, and she didn't. Her story was about times in the ISL, how swimmers are, you know, swimming free of the burden of times, which of course is an amazing angle. I was dying with envy. Um, I just, I just like, I just like that you were stuff. competitive with Karen Krauss. <laughs> I mean, I have to be, I'm like, oh, did she get to my sources already? Is this, you know, have I waited too long? Cause the story took a little bit while longer to develop than I expected. And, you know, I know Karen, I love Karen. I emailed her and I said, just to be honest with you, I'm totally envious. How do you come up with these angles where you find the perfect thing that appeals to the general sports fan, but also to those of us that know the sport best. And, you know, she walked me through her process, um, the general process of, you know, writing about niche sports and um, how you kind of let go of the nitty gritty, which is something I was struggling with in this story, you know, my instinct is to explain how ratings work, explain the minutia of how jackpot times work. And, and she was like, you know, you learn over time to let go. And that's something I'm definitely still, still working on, but that was how this went. So let's just put some context to here. Uh, Karen Krauss works for the New York times. She started as a teenager writing for swimming world magazine. And she was like this star teenage writer covering um, Olympians. And it was a very, it was kind of an unusual thing, but she ascended to the New York Times. She, but to really just crystallize it, uh, Karen Krauss covered me at the Olympic Games, you know, nearly 30 years ago. And she's still covering the sport. And the funny thing is, if you go to a national championships, Olympic trials, Olympic Games, um, you know, I'll sit back and watch um, reporters and I see what they're doing. And Karen does this weird thing where she kind of hovers out of the bunch and you can see the wheels turning and, and then she'll come up and you'll I'll be like, Hey, what's, what's going on? And she's, and she's working through what, what is the big story of this moment today of the entire event? And she starts working out what that is. And it's um, so I like that she lets you into her process. Me too. Me too. Um, but yeah, that's basically how this, how this ended up. I, you know, bounced some ideas off of people I know, swim, swim staffers, some of them who know the sport. I kind of came down on this angle, which is that swimmers love it. Swimmers think it's great. They're totally bought in. But there's this dichotomy between that and what we're seeing from the media side of things. And, and you know, the people I'm talking to were saying, yes, that's that's the angle. I think you should run with that. And that just kind of confirmed my my thoughts about it. And then just kind of ran with it from there. So let's just talk about the elephant in the room. The elephant in the room is something that everybody knows. If you're a part of the swimming culture, you desperately want this to work. One of the quotes that you give me at the bottom of your story and not near the top is Mel, St- <laughs> I'm stealing <laughs> it's, it's, But it's, it's, it's uh, I said that I nearly had a panic attack before this started because I desperately, you know, I'm compromised. Uh, I'm a part of the culture and I desperately wanted it to be successful, but there was the fear that it, that it, that it could just all go away. So, uh, and, and all of the athletes, you're very nice to quote everyone. Everyone desperately wants this, but when the rubber hits the road, the business has to work. And, uh, and we're, we're judging sports, professional sports on metrics that are, are very, very, um, clear cut, uh, vendors have to be paid. Athletes have to be paid. Profit margins have to be hit at some point in time that that is realistic, and an audience has to show up. And uh, and what I like about your piece is that you don't you don't beat around the bush. You're like here here are the numbers, and this is what it means. And uh, d- I know that you care about swimming, but I also know that you're you're extraordinarily professional, and that you're you put that aside and you speak your mind. Uh, did you, did, did, do you, do you have an inner turmoil when you're, when you're like, okay, I gotta be honest here. I mean, I think any journalist knows that their goal is, or any good journalist knows that their goal is just to tell the facts. And, you know, as much as I similarly, as a fan want this league to succeed, you have to recognize the realities of their financial situation. And I think, you know, even Caitlin Sandino points out, um, and I quote her on this saying, you know, this whole endeavor has been so generous by Constantine. It's a generous effort, but the reality is if we don't start getting sponsors, if we don't start finding other revenue streams, this is going to be short-lived. And like you said, everyone wants it to work, but there are questions that are just undeniable in terms of the viability financially. So it's a, um, and, and you and I talked about this ahead of your piece. And when you were just talking it through, um, 
there, there's been several articles written about major sports and it, this is, I'm, me, I'm meandering, but this is the topic. Um, and it, it boils down to this. I'm, I'm saying that you have to, you have to measure total reach, social, all the articles written, um, television, uh, the entire branding apparatus has to have a massive footprint. When I say massive, um, it needs to be north of 40 million over a season. And ideally, you need to be somewhere in the range of 120 million. And I don't know what those numbers are. Uh, but after you and I talked uh, by phone ahead of you, when you were writing your future in this podcast, I actually reached out to Dimitro, who everyone knows, who's a part of swimming, who is the head of the ISL USA. And I said, and he, and he, his answer, his response was, Mel, we are aware that is a part of our business model. And, uh, and he did not give me an answer on what the total reach was, but that is forthcoming. However, um, it, it's, um, when, when I think about football, basketball, um, major league sports, everyone in sports currently right now is suffering. Everyone is, is their, their, Television ratings are down. Um, the audience appears to be shrinking, but um, the argument and the debate is, okay, um, the NBA is, is, is not suffering because the NBA has a social media apparatus that is, that, that, that is just massive and extraordinarily strong. And that's where they're measuring their success. And in a world with Gen Z and millennials and in a world where esports is encroaching in more and more on on sports in the real world, that that that's the equation. Did, did that figure into what you were went to to your thoughts or, or your or your team there at Front Office Sports? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, obviously your point about you know their overall impressions having kind of the summation of being a viable business is is absolutely correct. I think for a lot of people I talked to have said is the impressions they're getting from what athletes are doing are great. It's as someone who follows a lot of swimmers, it's really obvious they're pushing out very concerted campaigns to, you know, publicize certain news, push certain messages, stuff like that. Um, what they're still lacking on a lot of people say is, you know, kind of drilling down on that behind the scenes content that could really take them to the next level of, of being a real like media entity. You know, we're seeing this a lot in, in soccer right now, tons of, um, documentaries, kind of hard knocks-esque things, which if you're not familiar, is kind of the behind the scenes preseason football show that HBO does. Um, hard knocks-esque documentaries are just becoming the craze right now. And I think the ISL, I can tell in some of the things they do, they've got their um, over the top service, they've got their website that has kind of uh, supplemental content on it. It's there, it's happening, it's turning behind the scenes. I think what we've yet to see is this really, um, well produced concerted effort to to make something unified that might be a, an interesting product for fans to watch and i think that might take them to the next level of being that year round media entity that you suggest they really need to be to be viable i'm quoting the piece is saying this can't be a seasonal business this has to be a year round business that everyone if you are in professional sports you need to be working you know 10 months a year 11 months a year ideally 12 months a year so you have to be constantly pushing your brand and reaching out to the people who support your sport. Uh, we were this year, this is 2020 has been the, the, the worst year in, in anyone's life. This is it. This is, this is a, you know, we're, we're going to have 400,000 Americans dead. Uh, just looking at the United States, probably by February, uh, 150,000 died in world war two. Um, some people might deny that there's a that there's a pandemic and that COVID is real, but the truth is it it's it's taking a massive toll on everyone. So ISL pulled this off during a pandemic. And what what's important about that piece of information is to understand that ISL actually has a plan to work year round, and ISL had a plan heading into this season to do the type of documentary that you're talking about. However, they were stymied by my mother nature and uh maybe i shouldn't say mother nature we should just say nature and uh, it, it's it's a I, so i i think that the plan is there and i think that they basically got the football across the the you know in, into the end zone because that's all they could do 
And, uh, and, and I told you on the phone, I'm like, you know what? I give them an A plus just because they did this during a pandemic. But it, interesting that you bring up Hard Knocks documentaries. And uh, it, it, yes, I, I, that's something I would have liked to have seen. It's like, can, can you do that? They're already there. You can create the content. Somebody can do this later. I would not be surprised if we do see something cobbled together that's released this spring because I yeah. know it's there. Yeah, Did and I think share that with you? Bubble, nobody has shared that with me. Um, I think the bubble environment, though, really lends itself to doing this sort of thing. It would be, I can't imagine that they don't have something in the works because that would be such a huge misstep, in my opinion, if they didn't make something of this. And I'm, you know, 98% confident that we're going to see more out of them because it's just such an obvious thing to do. Um, how that carries out, you know, in the next seasons where, you know, we haven't seen plans for geographically how things are going to work yet. Um, that's another question, whether they can, you know, continue to do that. But I mean, the, con the value of the content of, you know, pulling off an international bubble, what some people are saying, you know, is kind of a look at what an Olympics bubble might look like. Like that'd be a huge missed opportunity to not have made something unified out of what was going on behind the scenes there. It's just so you know, at the end of, of the first season, the the discussions behind the scenes, they, so they reach out. The, so let's just say this. Uh, let's, let's put it in this context. Um, FINA, USA Swimming. Um, USA Swimming is, is, is the best. USA Swimming is the most professional in GB. They are fantastic to work with. Um, if you don't like them, you don't like them because they're, you know, they're, they're holding the line. They're doing their job. They're, 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 they're moving on their mission. And that's not always the easiest thing. If you're a media company and you're trying to report a story, but you have to respect the fact that they are professional and they're, and they're great at what they do. Um, FINA, not so great at this, but they, they still will engage with their, they're, they're a little bit, they can be abysmal at times. ISL, on the other hand, uh, they have a very, very different culture. And I can tell you that early on the process, they brought us in. Coleman Hodges sat at the table with me when they were long before they even launched. And they were involved in creative conversations. And the creative conversations were with the understanding that no one's going to share these conversations, but this is what's this is what we're thinking about what's coming down the pipe pipeline. The the type of media outside the pool that you're describing is uh, that was there before season one, but it was seriously talked about after season two and then the pandemic happened. It's um, the impression I get is that they are, um, they're willing to fail. They're willing to move as fast as they can with a small team and they're willing to fail and they're okay with failure. Like they, they, they see failure as, okay, we learned that that doesn't work. Let's keep moving. And that is a very, very different culture than what I've seen in uh, traditional Olympic sports. Uh, wh what does it look like to you from the outside looking in? I mean, I, I will say, you know, credit where it's due. They released the statement after the season where they, you know, address some of the, the financial claims that have been made against them. And they said basically due to us wanting to move so fast, just put our heads down and get this done. Yes we may have missed some payments. Yes, we found it hard to, to, you know, meet some obligations there. So I think you're absolutely correct. They, I think it was all about getting this season pulled off and, and, you know, whatever casualties there were in the process happened and they're a young league and, you know, they plan to pick things up again next season. Um, I certainly hope that they have the funds to just keep, keep doing that. Um, but I, you know, you kind of have to respect the hustle there. They're just saying, we're doing whatever it takes and what happens happens. And, you know, I wish that was a, a mentality I could take into my own life, but sometimes, you know, like that's, that's kind of fun, but I hope on, on, you know, a financial level it's, it's viable and that nobody gets hurt in the process. You, you, you had a t tremendous amount of forethought research and time that you put into this feature. And I, and I really hope people have, have paused and read it before they listen to this conversation. The, um, uh, it is, in, in terms of business, I shared this with you uh, before you wrote your feature, and it's, uh, it's probably not the most interesting and entertaining piece, but it is a reality of running a business. And um, the reality of running a business is that you sign contracts and those contracts have deliverables. 
And if you're signing a contract with an outside vendor and that vendor, maybe they have to deliver 100 pieces of media that is going to, to buoy and support and message for you. If you don't, if you don't deliver on your deliverables, um, people pay you slowly and they don't pay you fully. And sometimes people get upset in their lawsuits and it's, uh, so, and what happens is that people might not, I'm not saying that this is the case in any lawsuits or any, any disgruntled vendors, but uh, I used to be like, oh, wow, somebody's getting sued. They must, these guys are dishonorable. And after being in business for as many years as I've been in now, I think, did they do the job? Right. <laughs> did they do what they said they would do? So I'm, I'm our experience with ISL has been that um, and what we've learned is that they, they might not pay as fast, but they do pay. And my experience in, in the world is that sometimes people don't pay net 15, net 30. Sometimes they pay net six months. You get, pay, you get your paycheck six months later. And that, and that can be frustrating. But it's, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. I, I, only time's going to tell us what really happened there. But my better judgment tells me this is sort of what's going on. Right. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I think a lot of this is an only time will tell question. The league is so young. I mean, it's unlike anything I've really seen in my lifetime in terms of starting up a brand new professional sports league. So for me, I feel like a lot of the answers are just time will tell. And maybe, you know, a year from now, I write another piece like this and, and things have changed. And I am certainly looking forward to doing that if that's the case. In, in, ter in terms of business, because this would be very helpful. Front office sports to me is is like the cool new iteration of sports business daily. Is that is, is that fair assessment? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a fair assessment. We're a little bit more newsletter focused though, um, which is something that I, I think a lot of people don't don't quite realize from the outside. Because if you're following my work, uh, I've written a lot of web content, but our newsletter is our main business. And but here's the thing: if this is uh, this is intelligence your newsletter is intelligence for people in the business of sport. And that is, uh, I'm glad you think so. I think so. Too. No, but, no, but that's what it is. If you're, if you're in the business of sport and you're trying to look down the road, you're trying to look into your crystal ball, what's going to happen next year, five yeah. years, 10 years down the road. I, I, this is a, I, this is not what I wanted my life to be, but it's, 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 it's information that matters greatly because the business of sport is a very big business. So, um, yeah, I'm a fan. So the, here's my, here's my two cents on ISL and what it mean, what it's going to mean in terms of sponsor dollars. You have to cross a certain threshold as a business, meaning you have to have uh, a large enough audience in terms of television, or you have to be able to make the case that my audience is television plus print plus newsletter plus social, and our audience is massive based on those metrics, and that has to be big enough to pull in uh, IMG, uh, Wasserman Media, Wasserman, uh, Octagon. So until you're a, until the teams are a brand or ISL is a big enough brand that they can outsource all of those sales to, to large partners. Because if you're not big enough to pull in someone like um, a soda company or a beer company, you're, you're not going to make it. The, the, the truth about the business of swim is that, um, you're talking about very small vendors in the aquatic market itself. And, uh, and I don't know if anyone talked about that behind the scenes to you. No sponsors were, were not so much something that I touched on. It is very apparent. If you just watch an ISL meet, nothing is, is sponsored versus watching, you know, USA swimming meet, everything got it has its sponsors. You know, we've got golden road brewing, we've got, you know, um, Phillips, we've got, uh, the tire company whose name I'm blanking on, but every little thing has its sponsor. And that is not the case with the ISL. And I don't necessarily think that that's by design. You know, it's not necessarily a, a look and feel thing. Like they don't want their sponsors there. I think they're not there. And it sounds like you think the same. And I'm, I'm really curious to see how that plays out. But I do think that one thing that might affect that going forward is, is whether the, the league stays in this bubble single site format or whether we move into you know the markets that it was initially slated to be in, and whether those teams then can reach out to more local sponsors and build up that way. So I think that'll, you know, be a big factor going forward. 
It's tough. Local sponsors are tough, but it's a, um, I, I think that the, another elephant in this room, and certainly with this conversation is, uh, the gamification of sports, which is betting. And, um, that, that is, that's it. Cause if you can, if, if people can, if we gamify swim and, and you can bet, and then this is absolutely a business and it's a massive business. And it is, um, that is definitely a part of the thinking. And that's not just the thinking for, uh, an, an enterprise like ISL. That is, that is, that's in the cards for all sports, Olympic sports too. Yeah. Everyone's, that it's, is- it's on the table. Yeah, that is hands down the biggest trend in sports right now, especially with the legalization, you know, state by state here. That actually is kind of the first angle I was looking at with the ISL before I was considering writing a full story. I was thinking of just kind of putting out some feelers, seeing what info I could get about betting. Um, CBS has a has a betting partnership with William Hill, and I reached out to both parties and they said, you know, we had no plans for broadcast integrations um, this season, whereas, you know, with some other sports, you're seeing uh, odds increasingly displayed, you know, on screen, which is uh, a big development <laughs> in sports. Um, and I reached out to a couple, you know, major odds makers, and they said, you know, we're also not planning at this time. This was pretty early in the season or just before to do anything. Um, and as far as I know, that didn't change throughout the season. But I think absolutely that's something that they're going to have to start doing because, one, swimming would be super fun for it. I think fans would love it. Um, and two, like, you just can't not right now. Literally, everybody is. Every, everyone's everyone's rushing into this marketplace. But it's a, but that does take you from uh, living in in the red and, 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 and you're suddenly in the black. You're suddenly, you're suddenly turning a profit. It, it, it moves it very quickly. And I, it feels to me like the product is, I think it's improved season one to season two. Do you guys think it improved season one to season two? I do. Um, the first season I was already pretty wild with the production value. And then I think, um, you know, getting Rowdy on the broadcast along with Bernie, that was a great pairing. And just the graphics are, are great. I think at times a little overdone maybe, but they're super fun. And I I think the production was, was great. And, you know, I think throughout the season, I, I believe they made some updates in terms of what kind of scoring they were showing on screen and just updating it for things that fans, you know, expressed that they wanted and that would improve their experience. And I do think they're doing a great job with that. Uh, let's so we're, we're down to our last nine minutes and we'll, we'll let you know when we're, when, 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 when you, you can do your last response. So let's, let's give some people some inside information. Um, this is what we know was going on in the background. I'd like to know if you knew this as well. Uh, year, season one, there was a locked battle between FINA and ISL, which was very public and, and you touch on it. And I think you, you sum it up very, very well. Uh, the, I think that it's a fair assessment <clears throat> that the governing bodies at the national level that are signatories of FINA all across the world were in a very uncomfortable position season one because their athletes were telling them that they wanted ISL. FINA was trying to fight it and, uh, and the NGBs were caught in the middle and the NGBs also had, they have a, a level of, um, of incentive that if this, you know, I think, I think behind the scenes they're like, this isn't really a business, but if it might be a business, then it also takes a part of the economic hardship of support off of their, off their books. So it's sort of like, hey, someone's gonna gonna take a gamble on this. Maybe maybe it'll work. This past year, it felt like the ISL got a little adversarial with the NGBs because the it, suddenly the NGBs didn't want their athletes traveling. Um, did you talk to anybody about that? Anything behind the scenes there? Did you learn anything? No, we didn't discuss that. And you know, I am familiar with their whole um, like anti-bullying campaign. I believe was what they were calling it early in the season. I think with. Um, I think it was about Australia, correct me if I'm wrong, but that is, you know, I think one of the things that um, a couple people have cited in their resignation letters, in their criticisms of, the, criticisms of the league is that the public opposition to both the Olympics and to traditional governing bodies makes it very hard to play nice. And I think there's definitely concern that that is an issue going forward. I th- I th- but personally, I think- that's not something I reported on. 
Yeah, it's it, but you kind of touch on it because you sum everything up, and it's it's there. And anybody who's followed the story, I think you brought it into your feature enough so that it's like you know you, you note it. But it's uh, I think that that was I'm very bullish on ISL, and I'm but I'm also compromised and hopeful, you know. But I am bullish on them because of their social reach and the product that they've created, and because of the gamification of swim uh, that's off in the distance. Uh, however, that was a huge misstep. You don't make you don't publicly fight a governing body if you're another organization. I think I think it's a big mistake. You you th- that 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 just felt a little bit like middle school. I, th- I think it was a poor move. Did it come across that way to you? Absolutely. Um, you won't really see other major professional sports leagues. Maybe they'll you know dance around it in certain ways, but they will not bad mouth another league another governing body uh in the same kind of explicit way the isl did and, and you know getting their athletes behind it too i actually found that a little bit shocking that they had so many athletes kind of on on board with this uh pretty radical message pretty radical campaign coming from a league um i am really curious to see how, how that sort of thing plays out going forward because that's a unique way of doing things for sure and i know that the isl has their you know bullish on everything attitude and that's kind of how they do things but i just don't know if that's you know going to continue to drive in the future i have a very, have a very bad analogy it's sort of like this and people aren't going to like it but i don't care it's kind of like a religion um are you a part of the faith of isl or are you a part of the faith of the olympic movement and it's these are two religions or philosophies and what do you buy into and I don't think I'm outing anybody by saying this. I think Tom has been public about this, Tom Shields, who you quote several times in your feature. <clears throat> Tom is uh, Tom wants to be Tom wants to participate at the Olympic level. But for him, he could live his life as an international swimming league pro. Like that would he's like, I would be satisfied if this is this is my legacy. Uh, and I think that that is a turning point. And something tells me if you we're hearing it from him. I'm wondering what percentage of these athletes would say the same thing. Hey, I don't have to go to the Olympics. I could just do this for 10 years and then retire. Yeah. I think Tom's a great example. Um, I actually have a quote from him. I can't remember if they made an article, honestly, but I thought it just really summed it up. Um, You know, I had asked him just to spell it out. Obviously I know, you know, but I said, you know, to spell it out, why is it so important to have this league every year? And he says, this is a year to year championship and a year to year opportunity to expose ourselves to the world. What we can accomplish in 16 years in the Olympics, we can accomplish in four here. Um, then he says, uh, we're going to develop much more quickly and we have the freedom to do so because we're not laden to the bureaucratic driven world that that lifestyle, the Olympics is. I thought that really just summed it up. Straight it's, up. It, it, it does That's... sum it up. We're, <laughs> we're down to just under four minutes and we can, we can do all of our juicy stuff here in the last 10 minutes, which usually are our best things. I will say this as, as somebody who's old, who has Olympic medals and has been watching this from the sidelines for many, many years and, and has skin in the game. Um, it was my hope through the, through my experience and my culture, it was my hope that USA swimming would, would have created a professional apparatus, a professional platform that would have then been something that went beyond the borders and was this, this product that could go to London or, or Madrid or Tokyo and I felt like it was the Grand Prix. Before the pro swim, it was the Grand Prix. And the window of time to do it was 2009 to 2012 with, while Michael Phelps was still in the game. And it didn't happen. And, and, and frankly, bitter about that. I'm like, that, but to me, it felt like it was such a massive opportunity loss. I don't know if anybody's talked about that to you or if that's something that occurred to you. Uh, I think Rowdy you know, definitely talked about the need uh, for star power. And I think everyone's very happy to have, you know, Caleb involved in this now and performing the way he is. But I think it's, it's very clear that they need the star power to, to build something. Um, you know, we didn't really talk about the missed opportunity before, but it's going to be huge to get, you know, people like Caleb, I think ideally, you know, Katie Ledecky and Simone Manuel stars like them with their broad appeal on board as well to, because, you know, swimming is a star driven sport. It's, it's for my entire life, basically it's been, Michael Phelps, Michael Phelps, Michael Phelps. And now it's turning to Caleb, Caleb, Caleb. Personally, I would love to see, you know, Katie Simone, Katinka, et cetera, but it's always going to be a start or at least for now with maybe less so with the ISL, ideally, I think 
such a star driven thing and and they need to capitalize on the moment when they have their stars. So for us inside the culture, who's very close to it, you know, Dressel's a big star, but Dressel's going to be a global star. Once, once a billion people watch you, changes things. Uh, so will you come back on the podcast and, and talk to us about this topic? Because I think it's going to be evolving. I think we're going to learn a lot more. Of course, anytime. Are you going to be writing more features? If this evolves, will you be covering it on front office sports? Absolutely. We'll become, you know, your premier ISL destination, other than Swim Swam, of course. But yes, absolutely. Very much on the beat. For the business of swim, I think it's an absolute go to. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. We got Tori Hart, and she's coming back, giving us a, that expert view. Um, any parting thoughts? No, I'm just so happy to to see you guys and to you know be back with my old friends. And uh, I certainly hope that this, for my own sake, that professional swimming continues to be a business because I want to keep covering it like a real business. And I think that the opportunity is definitely there. You've been listening to the Swim Swam podcast. Stay tuned for new episodes every week. You can take Swim Swam podcast on the go by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. Look for links in the description below and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos as well.